It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Speaker, uh, it looks as though this will be the last question period for uh, a while, and so I'd like to do a bit of a re review of this government's priorities. This government has uh, really delivered if you're a wealthy developer with insider connections, Speaker. We saw this government prioritize carving up protected greenbelt lands to the benefit of deep-pocketed friends of the Premier and his party, lands that help Ontario mitigate the effects of climate change, lands of ecological significance, and crucial farmland. Speaker, to the pre Premier, will he prioritize our environment and stop carving up the green belt for his insider friends? And to reply, the Premier. Well, th thank you. And, and before I respond um, to the opposition, John, the, the wolf was Ralph and the, the sheepdog was Sam. And I just, you know, figure you're Ralph, I'm Sam. I'm protecting the, the herd and you keep trying to go after the herd. And, and to, 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 the, to the clerk, to, to the clerk, there's many attributes, but one of the most important things is you're a Tobacco boy. So thank you. So, Mr. I think I ran half my time out, but I'll, I'll supplementary question. But Mr. Speaker, let's look at our accomplish accomplishments just over the last year, just since January. We reached a record low unemployment, the lowest since 1989. That's 34-year 34 34 record unemployment. We landed a historic Volkswagen deal to build the largest manufacturing plant in the history of Canada. We, I'll go the supplementary. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, um, on to another one of this government's priorities: emergency room closures. Yeah. Emergency room closures are happening right across this province. Some of them permanently. Help used to be right around the corner. Now more people are finding themselves driving further and further for emergency or urgent care because this government decided to funnel money toward private corporations instead of fixing the staffing crisis. The NDP proposed a solution to turn the lights back on in the public operating rooms that we already have and get Ontarians the surgeries they've been waiting for. The Conservatives voted no. Speaker, back to the Premier, will he finally prioritize over insiders and make health care public once again? Premier. As I was saying, Mr. Speaker, we landed the largest deal in the auto sector. We are the EV capital of the world, not just North America, of the world, with six of the largest car manufacturers right here producing automobiles and the batteries. Mr. Speaker, we expanded GO service to Niagara, bringing the total to 21 round trips per week and talking about health care. Mr. Speaker, there's no government in the entire country that has invested more in health care than we have, $81 billion. We're building 50 new sites or upgrading 50 new sites to a, a tune of $50 billion. We had more reg nurses register last year in the history of this country, 12,000 of them. 12,000. We added 3,100 beds. We're going to be adding another 3,000 beds, more than, again, any time in the history of this province. We're investing in our doctors and, and new doctors coming online with two medical schools. Did you just... Tell us more, yeah, Okay. <laughs> Two medical schools, more undergrads and grads than ever before. Thank you. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, this government's status quo is closed emergency rooms. We have more nurses leaving Ontario than they could recruit. We have not a family Order. doctor Order. in sight. 2.2. Million Ontarians don't have a family doctor. Speaker, investing in health care or education or housing, you know, instead of doing those things, the government is prioritizing giving $650 million to an Austrian corporate conglomerate to build a luxury spa on top of a public park. While small town emergency rooms are being shuttered, the company behind this elite luxury spa 
is being given hundreds of millions of dollars and a 95-year lease. Speaker, back to the Premier. Question. Will he cancel his $650 million private spa and instead invest that money in communities that desperately need it? Members will please take their seats. Premier. Well, since we took office, Mr. Speaker, let's just go back 15 years ago when the NDP and Liberals were running this province. They chased 300,000 jobs out of the province. Let's move forward five years. There's 670,000 more people working today than there was five years ago. There's 380,000 jobs available in every single sector across, our, uh, across Ontario. We are an economic powerhouse in North America. We've created the conditions and the climate for people to come here, open up a business. Matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, last year alone, 85,000 new businesses opened right here in Ontario. We cut $8 billion of burden off the backs of companies as the Liberals and NDP chase these companies out of the country, out of the province. We're attracting companies from all over the world to invest Response. right here in Ontario, the best place to live, work, and raise a family. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, I will say, I think this sounds to me like a government that's actually lost its way. I understand why the Premier, <laughs> Premier can't answer the questions. Order. Order. I have to be able to hear the member who has the floor, in this case, the Leader of the Opposition. Order. Restart the clock. Leader of the Opposition has the floor. Uh, Speaker, thank you. It's, it's a government with the wrong priorities. It's a government that's become far too comfortable on the uh, government gravy train. Order. Ontarians across the province are writing, they're calling, they're rallying because they see a Order. government that's out of touch. So I'd like to ask the Premier some more questions about his priorities. Because after five years of this government's transit policies, the Eglinton Crosstown project is completely off the rails. Years behind schedule, way over budget. Not so unlike the Ottawa LRT fiasco, all while people are right waiting and businesses are shutting down, Speaker, to the Premier, will he prioritize getting the Eglinton Crosstown back on track so Ontarians aren't left waiting any longer? Premier. Thank you for the question. Actually, the facts are, Mr. Speaker, we're building the largest transit project in North America, $30 billion with four new lines getting people out of their cars into transit. There's nowhere in North America that, is, that are doing four subway lines, but thank, thank you for that question. And housing. We have a housing crisis. Last year, there have been 27,427 housing starts in this province. That's up 16 percent from the previous record year. Purpose-built rentals starts across the province are up 143 percent, more than double than last year. Housing starts in Toronto are up 178 percent from last year. Housing starts in Brampton are up 65 percent than last year. Multi-unit construction in Ontario increased 7.6 percent since February, the largest increase in the country. We saw a 25 percent increase in condo permits, also Spons. the largest in the country. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about education. This year, education spending is at an all-time high of $34.7 billion. Edu Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary. Once again, it's once again, it's like this Premier is not existing on the same planet that the rest of us are. I don't know where this comes from. Oh my God. This is a government. This is a government that doesn't even have a deadline for the Eglinton Crosstown. Right? Housing starts are down, not up. I want to talk again about the government's priorities. Stop the clock. The Leader of the Opposition legitimately has the floor, and she has every right to ask questions. This is question period. I have to be able to hear her. If the government side continues to interject loudly, I will start calling you out by name. Restart the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, 
I know why they don't like it, but let's get back to reality, back to this government's priorities. Speaker, the Conservatives like to say that they've prioritized workers, but when push comes to shove, they let workers down every time. Exhibit A. They took away the three measly paid sick days that people fought for at the start of the pandemic. Exhibit B, they took away the constitutional rights of education workers. Exhibit C, the Conservative members from Windsor won't lift a finger to help the striking workers at the Windsor Salt Mine out of work now for 111 days where the company is bringing in scab labour. The list goes on and on, Speaker, Question. but back to the Premier. Will he prioritize workers and pass the NDP's anti-scab legislation? Members will please take their seats. Premier. Can I get an extension of about an hour to show all our accomplishments? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, let's go back to transit for just one second before I get to education. Over $70 billion are being spent on transit, $23 billion on roads, building the 413, the Bradford Bypass, widening Highway 3 down to our great friends in Windsor. Let me tell you about Windsor. They've never seen more love from any government than they've seen from us, no matter if it's a new hospital, Salantis, job creation, Highway 3, schools. They've seen the love, and I felt it when I went down there. Let's just go back to education. As I said, education spending is at an all-time high of $34.7 billion. Yep. Education funding has seen a 27% increase since 2018. While the Liberals closed, remember those days, Mr. Speaker? They closed 600 schools. We're investing $15 billion to build new schools and child care spaces, including an additional $600 million in this year's budget. We've been invested $30 million more, double the math coaches across. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, you know, shameful there that the Premier would not even address the issues that we've raised around working people and working families in this province. Speaker, to wrap up, this is the state of Ontario now after five Order. long years under this government's watch. We've got a non-existent climate plan while communities are dealing with the most severe forest fire season we've ever experienced. We have emergency Order. Rooms closing while this government takes health care workers to court, a broken transit system held hostage by private contractors, and it's harder than ever before to afford a safe place to live. Ontario is a place that we are all proud to call home, but this Premier's wrong priorities are hurting people now, and yes, they are threatening the economic prosperity and future of this province. Question. Speaker, back to the Premier. Order. When will he change course, and will he change course today? Stop the clock. The member for Sault Ste. Marie will come to order. The member for Kitchener-Conestoga will come to order. The Associate Minister of Housing will come to order. Start the clock. The Premier can. Again, Mr. Speaker, one word 670,000 people are putting food on their table, paying a mortgage, buying a home because we created the climate and the conditions. Order. My Minister of Economic Development sends me a list every single night of companies coming in from all over the world. Mr. Speaker, and when people are out at work, do you Order. know what they need? They need childcare. They need childcare that we partnered up with the federal government to a tune of $4.69 billion, 28% over last year alone, Mr. Speaker. Then when it comes to long-term care, we know that the Liberals and NDP built, what, 617 Order. beds over 15 years? We're building, through our great minister of long-term care, over 60,000 new homes for long-term care, 30,000 new ones, 28,000 renovated ones. Mr. Speaker, I have an opportunity to speak to governors and ambassadors all over the world. They're saying, what are you doing in Ontario? You're on fire. You're leading the world. We're an active Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. The Leader of the Opposition will come to order. The Member for Waterloo will come to order.
The Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery will come to order. Let's start the clock again. Next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, during committee hearings, we learned new information about the Ontario Place redevelopment procurement process. Unbelievably, we learned that there was no fairness monitor appointed to verify the integrity of the process. We also learned that six days before the deadline for bid submissions, the deadline was suddenly extended by three weeks, even though Infrastructure Ontario had already received several bids. One bid that had not yet been received was the bid from Therma, which eventually won the redevelopment rights. So did that deadline extension give Therma an unfair advantage? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, Infrastructure Ontario is an arm's length government agency that is responsible for government procurements. They, they have internal controls to ensure that there is accountability and fairness and competitive processes. They report to a board that also has accountability and trans transparency measures. And of course, they work like any other agency with the FAO and the AG. Mr. Speaker, we had a successful call for development where, where we had a lot of interest because a lot of people are excited about Ontario Place, as are, as are we, and we will bring it back to life just like we said back yeah, in yeah. 2019. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. So this government not only gave Therma a last-minute deadline extension, it's also giving Therma a $450 million, give or take, parking facility that was not offered to the other Ontario Place bidders. Yesterday, we learned that the government wants to build the relocated Ontario Science Centre on top of this new parking facility. The minister told the CBC she had a business case showing that building a new science centre would be cheaper than making repairs, but yesterday the minister said she has no idea how much the new parking facility would cost. So, Speaker, stands to reason she has no idea how much it would cost with a new science centre as the cherry on top. Will the minister release the business case to the public or admit that she doesn't have one? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. First, the member says the parking is for Thermae, then the member says the parking is for the Science Centre. Do you know who the parking is for? It is for everyone. Here, here. It is for all Ontarians, the for the moms with three kids from Scarborough and Brampton, the from the people of Northern Ontario that visit Toronto and want a wonderful place to go. That is who the parking is for. Whoa. Next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In 2018, the people of Ontario elected our government with a strong desire for change in order to clean up the mess created after 15 years of mismanagement by the previous Liberal government. Wrong choices and wrong decisions by the Liberal government supported by the NDP hurt all Ontarians. Instead of a government that supported our province's working women and men, Elites and activists lectured the people of Ontario, insisting that they knew better. Instead of a government that worked with businesses and entrepreneurs, we witnessed companies leaving our province and, sadly, hundreds of thousands of people losing their jobs. And that's why it is so critical for our government to continue making the right investments to ensure that Ontario remains on a path to prosperity. Speaker. Can the Premier please outline how our government is ensuring that we are getting Question. it done for the people of Ontario by building a stronger province for everyone? Thank you, Speaker. Premier. Speaker, I want to thank our all-star member from Brantford Brant. You're doing an incredible job, and, and thank you. Friends, our, our, our government just took a simple approach when we came into office when the previous government had the largest uh, sub-sovereign debt in the world, the highest hydro rates, and, and companies were leaving. We, we remember those days, Mr. Speaker, high unemployment. Well, we believe in giving back to the people, putting money back in their pockets, no matter if it was getting rid of the tolls of the 412 or 418, or getting rid of the license sticker fee, or dropping the gas tax by 10 cents. Just imagine if there was 10 cents on top of the buck 60 that everyone's paying already. 
We believe in putting money back into people's pocket until they can stir the economy. They can go out there and buy a, buy a piece of furniture, maybe go out for dinner, maybe go on a trip somewhere in Ontario, other than doing what they did for 15 years, taking money out of people's Response. pockets, chasing companies out of this province. We have cut uh, the burden of businesses by $8 billion to attract more companies to come here to create more jobs, jobs and economic wealth. Thank you. The supplementary question, back to the member for Brantford Green. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the Premier for his response and his for, for his continuing leadership as he works on behalf of all Ontarians. The failure of the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, to focus on issues that matter to everyday people resulted in fragmented programs, failed policies, wasted opportunities, and an overall disregard for the hardworking people of Ontario. That is why our government must set clear priorities and focus on solutions that will demonstrate our respect for the people of Ontario. We must manage our resources well and implement measures that will continue to strengthen our economy while building up our workforce and ensuring that life is more convenient and affordable. Speaker, as we look to the future, can the Premier please elaborate on where the Question. people of Ontario can expect to see further leadership by our government that will help to make Ontario stronger? Thank you. Premier. Well, well, again, I, I want to thank the, the member from Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker, going back again five years ago, we basically had a bankrupt province. That's what it came down to. We had to go in there, focus on lean methodologies, respecting taxpayers. Over the past two and a half years, as I mentioned, through the great leadership of the Minister of Economic Development, We've seen $25 billion, a record anywhere in North America, $25 billion coming into our province. But we need skilled workers, Mr. Speaker. And through the great work of the Minister of Labour, we're spending $1.4 billion working with our union partners to train the future skilled tradespeople that are going to build the city, that are going to build the towns across the province. We have more cranes, Mr. Speaker, than LA, Chicago, New York, Washington, Boston combined. There's a reason why people are investing in Ontario. There's reason, reasons why pension funds are investing here, because they know they have a business-friendly government that they haven't seen in 15 years. As much as the world is what? large when it comes to sectors across the province, I mean across the world, it's very small. We're leading the tech industry in North America. We're employing 411,000 people compared to the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Minister of Education. Oh, great, A staffing crisis driven by low wages is threatening the accessibility of childcare for families. Programs are limiting capacity and expansion targets are at risk. The Minister was overwhelmingly told by stakeholders in their consultations that they need to properly compensate childcare workers. In spite of years of raising these concerns, the province's contribution to the childcare budget remains flat. Staff have described this current wage floor as an insult. Will the minister implement recommendations from the experts in the field to keep Ontario's $10 a day program on track? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I mean, as we conclude the session, we could reflect back on this past year's one of progress when it comes to affordability, putting party interests aside. This parliament enacted a bill and a budget that has allowed us to cut child care fees by 50% for the families we represent. Eight to ten thousand dollars in savings per year, and we will go further. Of course, we need qualified ECEs. We need to recruit them and to retain the ones that work with our kids. It's why in the program we signed with the federal government, an additional dollar per hour has been committed per year. A commitment to install a wage floor for the first time and a clear commitment by the government to go even further. Mr. Speaker, in addition to increasing um, access to the ECs, increasing affordable child care options, we're building 86,000 spaces. This is a monumental step forward for Fonts. financial relief for the people of Ontario. We'll continue to work with the sector, with our workforce and our operators to make life more affordable for families across Ontario. Supplementary question. 
Speaker, the key issue is that we need those child care workers in those child care spaces in order for this, to, this program to survive and thrive and expand. We know the wage floor is well below what workers are saying is needed to address this crisis. The minister is stating that he knows that this is an issue and that he plans to increase wages. The question is how much and when. The Association of Early Childhood Educators are saying that they are cautiously optimistic but worry that it will still be less than what's needed and will be delayed by the rollout of a broader child care workforce strategy. Will the minister commit today to increasing ECE wages immediately instead of waiting for yet another report? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Education. Well, Mr. Speaker, after child care fees increased by over 400 per cent of the former Liberal government, our government got to work on a plan to make life affordable. Child care fees went from $46 a day to $23 a day on average today under this Premier's leadership. We can't discount how monumental that is for financial relief for working people and parents in Ontario. That is one of the most monumental ways this Parliament has made life more affordable. But I accept the premise we've got to do more for our workers. We've got to give them a reason to stay in work in a tough sector. We value what they do, which is why we've already increased their wages. We've committed to going further. We've also committed to expand access to 86,000 spaces by announcing a $213 million startup grant where we literally help incentivize the marketplace more spaces and therefore more workers in the communities that have disproportionately underrepresented amount of childcare spaces to their population. We're going to get this right. We're going to work together. And we are going to make life affordable for moms and dads across this province. The next question, member for Chatham, Kent, Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Like other regions across the province, communities in southwestern Ontario are experiencing population growth and business expansion. But traffic congestion, gridlocked highways through Leamington and Essex County are extending travel times for all road users while delaying vital goods and services from getting to our markets. Urgent action needs to be taken to build the necessary transportation infrastructure to keep our province moving. Unfortunately, transportation needs in my areas were consistently ignored by the previous NDP backing the Liberal government. The residents of Chatham-Kent-Leamington and people throughout southwestern Ontario deserve better when it comes to our transportation network. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to address the critical need for expanded transportation infrastructure? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Speaker, when our government took office, we committed to the people of this province that we would rebuild Ontario. <clears throat> Unlike the previous Liberal government, who left southwestern Ontario behind, our government is investing in this region. Why, Speaker? It's because we know that when southwestern Ontario is strong, the entire province is strong. I was proud to have recently joined the Premier and my colleagues to announce our government is moving forward with the widening of Highway 3. Here, here. We have awarded the contract to design, build and finance the widening of Highway 3 between Essex and Leamington. This investment will improve road safety and will keep people and goods moving. Speaker, our government is making historic investments in roads and in highways to tackle gridlock, connect communities and to build our economy. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her genuine leadership. The recent announcements made by our government will certainly address this long-standing and urgent need. These communities look forward to seeing construction get underway as soon as possible. This Highway 3 expansion will dramatically reduce commute times, increase road safety, and improve the movement of people and goods, but a further expansion of this infrastructure is still urgently needed. We're seeing tremendous growth in the industrial, agricultural, manufacturing and healthcare sectors in Windsor and throughout Essex County. Population growth, job creation and other major investments are driving the urgency for an expanded transportation network. This is why our government must continue to invest in this infrastructure to better support increased opportunities for trade through the busy Detroit-Windsor border. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government's investments in critical highway infrastructure and projects throughout southwestern Ontario will support our economy? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. 
Well, our government understands that in order to build a strong economy, we need the infrastructure to support it. And for the Windsor-Essex region, that starts with a strong transportation network. Speaker, this last year alone, trade between Michigan and Ontario was valued at more than $80.7 billion. And so that's why it is vital to keep this corridor moving. When our goods are stuck in gridlock, it only makes things more expensive. Speaker, not only are we moving forward with the widening of Highway 3, our government will also support the City of Windsor to build a new interchange connecting Highway 401 to the Lausanne Parkway. This critical investment Speaker, it will not only support economic development, but it will also help to increase trade opportunities across Ontario's borders. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The people of Kitchener and Waterloo are getting left behind by this government. I don't mean figuratively, I mean literally. There is so much demand for GO service on weekends when GO trains don't run that buses are completely packed with people, especially students, and they are being left behind in Brampton. On Tuesday of this week, the Waterloo Regional Council voted to send a letter to the government urging it to address exactly this. The people of Waterloo Region need and deserve two-way, all-day GO service, including on weekends. When can Kitchener expect a weekend train to get to Kitchener on the Kitchener line? Mr. Transportation. Speaker, well, I'm uh, happy to talk about our government's plan to bring two-way, all-day GO service to Kitchener-Waterloo, but I wonder why, if it's such an important issue for the member opposite, why she voted against our plan. You know, Mr. Speaker, we're moving forward with the largest transit expansion plan anywhere in North America. And while we're building subways and LRTs, we're also building a strong regional network, Mr. Speaker, that is going to bring two-way, all-day service across our entire network. And that is despite the opposition voting against it. But, Mr. Speaker, Kitchener-Waterloo is a growing area, and that's why Metrolinx is constantly monitoring the service and ridership levels, and that is why just recently we announced it increased bus service. And while the demand w was greater than we even thought, the next day we added double-decker buses to meet the demand in Kitchener-Waterloo. Mr. Speaker, we are there to meet the demands Spons? of Ontarians. The Greater Golden Horseshoe is growing, and we will make sure that our transportation network keeps up and meets that demand. Supplementary question. As Speaker, New Democrats will always vote against legislation that leaves Kitchener behind. The, the level of frustration has reached a tipping point, Speaker. I was speaking, to, I was speaking uh, with Justin Fan, a University of Waterloo student, who told the CBC he wants to use Go, Go Transit regularly, but he gets frustrated when he can't get on a bus. Ian McLean, president and CEO of KW Chamber of Commerce, has said that more trains will deliver, by some estimates, up to 170,000 new jobs, billions in new investment from the private sector. Trains are good for business and good for people and good for the environment. Why doesn't Kitchener-Waterloo deserve a train on the weekend? I, this is a direct question to the minister. When can they expect it? Because the buses are not getting Order. the people where they need to go. Members will please take their seats. Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. You know, only recently we, we released the preliminary design business case for the Kitchener project. That is going to provide more frequent and reliable service for people between Kitchener and Georgetown, and it's a great opportunity for, uh, for us to talk about the other investments that we're making along the corridor. We're increasing services as we're seeing ridership demands increase, which is why just recently we announced more trains to Brampton, Mr. Speaker. We announced new bus service to Kitchener, Mr. Speaker. And with respect to two-way all-day go and more frequent service on weekends, Mr. Speaker, we are building towards that. We are working closely with our rail partner, CN, to make sure that we can deliver the service that we have told Ontarians we will deliver. Mr. Speaker, we put forward a great plan to get Ontarians home and get Ontarians to work in an easier, more frequent way, Mr. Speaker. But when we do so, Mr. Speaker, the NDP vote against it. And Response. so the member opposite stands in this House and says she speaks for her constituents. Well, do her constituents know that when we put forward a plan that will actually deliver on the promise of two-way all-day go, she votes against it? No, no, no. Order. Next question, member for Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last year, paramedics in Ottawa set a new record, but it's not a good one. 
1,806 times the Ottawa paramedics hit level zero, Mr. Speaker. There were no paramedics available to respond to calls for more than 73,000 minutes. Paramedics spent 93,000 hours at emergency rooms in offload delay. The city is requesting provincial funding to help alleviate the offload delay problem at Ottawa's backlogged emergency rooms in our hospitals. Will the government step up and provide the funding Ottawa needs to keep more ambulances on the road? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. I will say that not only are we stepping up, but we have stepped up. Yep. In yep. the, um, we had a top-up of funding directly to Ottawa of $2.6 million through the dedicated offload nursing program. The member opposite knows that Good I've problem. spoken about this program many times because it is something that paramedics and the hospital clinicians see as a real game changer, ensuring that paramedics can get back out into community and make sure that they have appropriate care within the emergency department. We've done that work. I've met with the mayor of Ottawa on Monday, spoke to him again yesterday. I meet regularly and talk regularly to the Ottawa hospitals. We know that they are using effectively the 911 models of care where paramedics, with the patient's approval, can take individuals somewhere elsewhere other than the emergency department. These are Response. real changes on the ground that are making a difference in the lives of people of yeah, Ontario. Absolutely. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. What the government's doing isn't working because there's a report going to the city next week calling for more paramedics that are urgently needed. The offload delay at the Ottawa hospital means that paramedics are waiting two and a half hours at the emergency room to get back on the road. For two consecutive years now, Mr. Speaker, the Ottawa Paramedic Service has failed to meet the legislative response time of six minutes for sudden cardiac arrest. Last year, they only hit their legislated requirement 48 per cent of the time. Mr. Speaker, imagine watching your loved one die of a heart attack right in front of you because there's no ambulance available to come. Will the government do the right thing and get Ottawa the resources it needs to keep paramedics on the road responding to 911 calls? Minister of Health. Thank you very much. You know, the member opposite uh, speaks of a report that's going to the city next week. I've read it, and it talks about the benefits that they have seen as a result of using the dedicated offload nursing program. Um, in terms of Great land point. ambulance support, of course, we partnership 50-50 with our municipal partners. So every time they add a new ambulance, every time they add a new paramedic, the Ministry of Health and the province of Ontario is there to support with 50% funding, and we will continue to do that because we want to make sure that 911 models of care, dedicated offload nursing programs, a learn and stay program, Speaker, that is available in Northern Ontario for paramedics who train, we are covering their tuition and uh, education costs so that they can continue to serve and underserved communities. We're doing all of this work to ensure that the people of Ottawa and all of Ontario have Bonds. appropriate care in their community. Thank you. Next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. This spring, the minister announced that the village of Winston Park, a long-term care home in Kitchener, had opened a new recently constructed building that will provide more beds for seniors. Nevertheless, while this is good news for the local community, Ontario's broader long-term care sector is being impacted by a rapidly aging population. Despite numerous calls from experts and advocates, the previous Liberal government failed to acknowledge the critical importance of investing in long-term care facilities and services. This is why it's so vital that our government continues to plan ahead to address the cares and need for our seniors across our province. Speaker, can the minister please explain how construction projects like this one will support our seniors in Waterloo and the neighboring area of Cambridge? Member for Lanark Front, Nat Kingston, and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, and thank you to the member uh, for Cambridge for the, for the question. The expansion of the village of Winston Park is a game-changing project for the Waterloo and Cambridge area. This state-of-the-art facility now provides 224 safe, modern, long-term care beds, along with top-quality care and resources for residents. 
Our government is also, also supporting another 12 projects in Waterloo Region, including homes in Cambridge, Wilmot, Wilwix, and Kitchener. These are beautiful homes. Together, these projects will provide over 2,400 new and upgraded long-term care beds built to modern design standards. These investments will also bring many new jobs in the form of construction and health care staff. This government is investing over five, up to $5 billion for an additional 27,000 new long-term care staff. That's something that the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition might want to put in her review. Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for his response. It is essential that our government continues to prioritize the needs of our seniors in providing care and services that are resident central. Uh, by investing in new long-term care infrastructure and services, we will be able to build a stronger system and will provide care and support for Ontario seniors and their families. In considering the current and future needs for seniors, it is clear that we need to build more long-term care homes in communities across the province. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please provide an update on measures our government is taking to add more beds to Ontario long-term long care system. Member for Lanark Frontenac Kingston can reply. Speaker, over the past year, we have seen rising interest rates, increased construction costs, supply chain issues, which have slowed construction. But our government is not wasting any time to ensure that seniors get the quality of care and quality of life they deserve. That is why our government has provided an increase to construction funding subsidy designed to encourage long-term care homes across the province to begin building by August 31st, this summer. This will and has enabled the continued development of new long-term care projects. By building new beds, more seniors will be placed in modern, safe and comfortable new homes. This initiative and commitment by this government will result in shovels in the ground for 11,000 long-term care beds by August 31st. This is all part of our government's historic $6.4 billion plan to develop over 58,000 new and upgraded long-term care beds so we can Spons. meet the needs of our aging population. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Tomorrow, I will be joining parents, faith leaders, elected officials, and community members at a community rally in Broadview Avenue in Ottawa Centre. We are sadly having to oppose an anti-transgender, anti-queer hate rally that's happening at the foot of the street. This same group of people were on Broadview Avenue 17 months ago. One of them, if you can believe it, Speaker, traveled all the way from British Columbia to display homophobic and transphobic placards outside three public schools. Shame. But on that day, Hundreds of people came to block the visibility of his placards, and tomorrow we are going to do it again. Speaker, I want to know, will my friends in government join us and call out this hate? The Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's, um, you know, without question, Ontario's home to a strong and vibrant 2SLGBTQI community who have helped shape our province and made it into the success it is today. With Pride Month well underway, as uh, my, my colleague stated, I want to take this opportunity to honour their strength, their courage and resilience, as well as to celebrate the important uh, contributions they make to our province each and every day. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as a citizenship of, multi uh, citizenship of multiculturalism, I've been working with our 2SLGBTQI community um, and will continue uh, to work with them um, and all allies and partners to build a stronger, safer, more inclusive Ontario where people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds can be uh, all Ontario home. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate what my friend of government just said, but my question is really intended uh, for the Solicitor General because I, con I consider this to be a public safety matter all for right. queer and trans kids in our community and all over Ontario. As, as we just heard, this is Pride Month, but sadly, and I'm sure many of us are hearing it, the incidences of hate against queer and trans people are on the rise, and some people are fanning the flames. So at home, we're gathering peacefully but determinedly 
to show queer and trans youth we are on their side. I've heard members from across this house say the same thing. So, Speaker, through you, does the government have a public safety message, a guarantee to queer and trans youth in Ottawa Centre and everywhere in this province that everyone in this house sees them, loves them, values them, and we will not let them be threatened by hate or bigotry ever in the province of Ontario? Here, here. And to respond, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my friend for the question. Let me be clear. Yes, we condemn all forms of hate. All forms of hate. We have a zero tolerance, zero tolerance for hate-based crime. And Mr. Speaker, everyone should feel safe in their own homes and communities. But Mr. Speaker, let me say this. For those that do not wish us well, for those who feel we don't have a right to live in our communities, to raise our children, to pray, to work, and to love who we want, and to live how we choose, we will call them out. Thank you. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. June is Seniors Month in Ontario, and I was honoured to have the Minister and his parliamentary assistant in my community last Friday to kick off Seniors Month at my Seniors Community Connections Expo held in Newmarket. Seniors Month is a time to recognize the contribution of seniors in our province and to respect and celebrate the work that seniors have done and what they are doing in our communities. The theme for 2023 is working for seniors. Our government is making great progress in helping seniors to stay independent, active and socially connected. However, it is vital to the health and well-being of Ontario seniors that our government continues to support initiatives that will help to keep our older adults engaged in their communities. Speaker, can the minister please explain the importance of Seniors Month Question. and how it helps to properly recognize the contributions of seniors in our communities? And to respond, the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you to the member from New Market Aurora for that important question. I was honored to attend her senior expo in New Market last week. She brought together 17 seniors and community groups, close to 100 seniors and senior leaders. They showed how active and involved they are in serving seniors in that part of your region. As a super senior, I'm calling everyone to do what the MPP from New Market Aurora did and bring their seniors together. Let's celebrate Seniors Month like never before. Supplementary question, back to the member for New Market Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And celebrating June as Seniors Month is an important way to recognize the contributions of seniors and highlight the importance of age-friendly communities. However, the risk of social isolation for seniors is a reality. Repeated research studies show that loneliness and social isolation have detrimental effects on the physical and mental health of seniors. This is an important issue. And that is why it is essential that our government continues to make investments into programs and services that help seniors to remain active and socially connected. Seniors in Ontario deserve our continuing support. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting the quality of life for seniors in Ontario? The minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Mr. Speaker, fighting social isolation is the best way we can help seniors. For example, 
I announced over $51,000 for New Market Senior Active Living Center, and another $51,000 for Aurora Seniors Active Living Center. This is a part of our government's $20 million investment in more than 280 seniors community grants and almost 300 senior active living centers across Ontario. Thanks to the, to the leadership of this Premier, this investment helps seniors stay fit, active, healthy, close to home, Response. connect to their communities, and fight social isolation. Beautiful. Next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, questions to the Premier. Speaker, many constituents in Northern Ontario must travel long distances to receive specialized health care. And the broken Northern Health travel grant system forces patients to cover those travel costs and accommodations up front, and then they have to wait to reimburse. For example, Denise and her husband, Stefan, are seniors on a fixed income, and they need to come to Toronto to see Stefan's neurologist. And Denise told me Stefan will get 41 cents a kilometre but only after the first 100 kilometers. My question, Speaker, is will the Premier remove cost prohibitive barriers like this one that make it difficult for Northerners to access proper care through the Northern Health Travel Grant? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. There is no doubt that there are unique challenges for patients who are looking to access health care in Northern Ontario or have to travel great distances to uh, get those treatments, which is why we've invested $48.2 million in the Northern Ontario Health Travel Grant, which, pays new, which paid out nearly 150 individuals uh, for those reimbursements. I will say that I am particularly proud of some changes that we have been able to make recently on the uh, grant and that ensures that individuals can now apply uh, electronically and get those reimbursements uh, directly into their bank accounts. It means that there is not the unnecessary delay and red tape, and it's been very helpful, particularly for individuals who have multiple trips and multiple treatments. So that is one example of how we are improving this grant to make sure Response. that people get their money back faster. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Uh, Denise wrote to my office about the Northern Health Travel Grant speaker. She said, my husband, Stefan, and I are both seniors on a fixed income. The neurologist has been good about doing visits via OTN, the Ontario Telemedicine Network, but he needs to see him in person this week. And then at a later date, St Stefan will require a procedure and have to stay in Toronto even longer. When Denise and Stefan come for medical care, the Northern Health Travel Grant will give them $100 a night for a hotel. However, the discounted, and I put that in quotes, Hospital hotel rates are now $250 a night. So although the, the, the minister is saying the system works better, Speaker, the reality is that Stefan and his wife are going to be out $150 as a minimum every night that they're here. And that's unfair for somebody who needs medical attention. My question, Speaker, is will the Premier commit to increasing mileage and accommodation compensation so seniors like Stefan aren't paying out of pocket to access essential medical care? Minister of Health. Again, I will remind the member opposite that we are improving this system to make sure that people get that money into their bank accounts in a more seamless way, particularly when they have to come for multiple treatments or uh, medical procedures. You know, it speaks to, frankly, why we continue to invest and expand our hospital capacities in the north, in Sudbury, in communities across Ontario. You know, the Premier made reference to it earlier today, over 50 different capital expenditures that are happening in hospitals across Ontario. We want to make sure that if it is appropriate and when it is appropriate, they can get that care closer to home. And it is, again, of course, one of the expansions that will happen under Bill 160 as we expand community and surgical diagnostic centres in communities across Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Member for Brantford, Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. As the MPP for Brantford Brant, I have always been proud to champion participation in sport in the communities that I represent. Sports contributes to better health, community pride, and a stronger economy. However, I am deeply concerned to know that, according to Ontario Soccer's CEO, the province is losing referees at an alarming rate. 
This decline in numbers is due to the increasing prevalence of abuse towards referees. To address this serious situation, I understand that Ontario Soccer is launching a body camera pilot project for soccer referees. Speaker, can the minister please share his response to this initiative being introduced by Ontario Soccer? Thank you. Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Um, Mr. Speaker, before I get to that, I'd also like to thank Mr. Decker for his service and many years from now. Many years from now, when my grandkids point to that picture and say, there's Papa, but who's the other guy? I'll simply say, he's the other guy who made a big difference in my life. Aww. Thank you. Uh, and to the member from Brantford Brant, um, thank you for you, what you do in sport and recreation in your community. It doesn't just stay with youth, it's all across the board, because that helps our health care down the road. Uh, to answer the question uh, directly, I went, really? We have to go to that extent now to put cameras on officials to make sure parents and fans on the perimeter of a field are not harassing officials. And let's be clear, Mr. Speaker, these officials aren't always adults. They're young people. They've decided to go get trained, participate. They don't necessarily have to play in sport, but they participate Honest. when they're officials. So it's, it's disgraceful. It's unnecessary, and we have to stop it, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here, here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And, Minister, I really appreciate your thoughtful response to this issue. Speaker, all Ontarians who participate in sport deserve to have a safe and supportive environment. Sadly, we are seeing young girls and boys being discouraged by a few irresponsible spectators who intimidate them with abusive yelling. Any form of harassment is unacceptable, and it must end. Speaker, can the minister please share any insights he has gained from his experiences with sporting organizations and with participants? Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, and again, thanks for the question. It, uh, this may sound strange, but and I've been very fortunate to be on sidelines and behind benches in sport, in minor sport, for a number of years. And I have some great friends as a result of participating in sport, not because of the players and the parents, but because of the officials. And I was asked on April 1st on the football side of things to speak at their conference in Hamilton at uh, Tim Hortons Field. There was 100 plus officials there, and they're there to learn more and to get better, Mr. Speaker. They're there to get better, not because they want to become pro uh, officials or umpires or referees, but because they want to make the game better. They want to give something back to their community. So when we talk about the time that they spent, afterwards I talked to their leadership group. I said, what is the key problem for you now? He said, we're losing people from age, but we're also losing young people, especially because of the harassment they're getting on the sidelines. Let me be clear, the culture of sport has to change, and we can all affect it in a positive way, because here's the statement. Without officials, there are no games. Yeah. Response? Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. My question is to the Premier. Special education needs within the Greater Essex County District School Board is continuing to grow. An additional 200 students will need special education supports for the next school year. Their deficit for 2023-2024 special education funding is projected at $10.2 million. The board has flagged the increasing needs of their special education programs with the Conservative government multiple times. In December last year, the GECDSB wrote to the Minister of Education calling on the province to address, and I quote, significant underfunding, end quote, and that the board expects to spend an additional $5.4 million on special education this year. Speaker, why won't the Premier adequately fund the special education programs needed and support the students of Windsor-Essex? Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We obviously very much are concerned about uh, those kids, and it's why this government, since coming to office in 2018, has increased the special education envelope of funding by over $540 million more. Um, Mr. Speaker, 
as a case study of that investment in this year's presentation of our funding for school boards, that is going to rise again by $124 million more. Wow. That's going to help families in Windsor and Essex and right across the region, and it's going to help the school boards have the staff in place to meet the needs of those kids. When it comes to EAs, the education assistants who principally work with those children, we have 3,200 additional EAs hired under our progressive Conservative government. We're proud of that, and we're going to keep going, Mr. Speaker, as we're hiring 2,000 additional frontline educators focused on literacy and math to help most kids that are most at risk. We are committed to strengthening the training of Once. our teachers, of our principals, and commit to hiring more staff to support the kids in your region and across Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I can tell you as a former trustee that this government and the government before them have chronically underfunded special education. And that increase the minister just mentioned Order. is less than the rate of inflation when we're talking about school boards already behind in having funding for special education students. And it's the students and their families that are suffering because you will not invest adequately so that their needs are met. In fact, Speaker, Lambton Kent, the province is only funding a quarter of the special education needs. Toronto District School Board has a $67.6 .6 million shortfall when it comes to special education. As I said, in the Greater Essex County District School Board, their shortfall is project projected at $10.2 million. They've already said that they're gonna, it's going to cost them $5.4 million for special education this coming school year. Speaker, students across Ontario with special education needs, their parents Question. and families, deserve a government that is making the necessary investments to see all students thrive. Will the Premier stop shortchanging students with special education needs and properly fund the special education programming and supports that all students need to thrive? Yes. Members, please take their seats. Minister of Education. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if we're going to be students of history and look back, let's look back to the Ray government where you literally left the province in an economic disaster and you didn't even pay the workers of this province called the Ray Days. So, you know, we reflect with great wisdom on the horrid track record of the NDP. We'll never go back. We're going to go forward and we're going to continue Order. to build schools. We're going to continue to modernize education. We're going to continue to play the challenge Order. function any responsible government will to demand better for the next generation of this province. If members opposite are concerned about the interests of public education, then vote today for Bill 98, the Better Schools and Student Health Homes Act. Join this government in standing up for accountability, for the rights of parents, and for better outcomes of focus on reading, writing, and math. We're going to get back to basics, and we're going to stand up for Ontario students right across this province. Speaker. The next question, the member for Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Great, it is encouraging to hear that our government is continuing to focus on initiatives that are providing women with opportunities for greater economic empowerment. However, there are still areas of concern that need to be addressed. The number of women employed in technology-related careers, as well as in the skilled trades occupations, are well below their male counterparts. The reality is, is that women only currently account for 5% of the skilled trades workforce. With more than 100,000 unfilled skilled trades jobs right now, it is critical that our government does all that we can do to attract more women to pursue these in-demand and rewarding careers. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on how our government is helping women to develop the skills they need to gain financial security? The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Member uh, from Newmarket Aurora, for the question and for the last question to close out this session. You know, I've gone across the province and have had a wonderful opportunity of meeting thousands and hundreds of women who are getting into the workforce and taking advantage of the programs and investments this government has made to support their flexibility 
and their training and skill development. This includes promoting a wide range of fields and careers for women and girls, helping entrepreneurs find supports and resources to create more women-led businesses. And that's why we've also expanded the Investing in Women's Futures program and the Women's Economic Security program. And together, we've assisted more than 3,000 women to start their businesses, pursue further training, and or their education. We are getting it done for women in Ontario because when women succeed, Ontario, Ontario succeeds. That concludes our question period for this morning.